Okay, thank you very well. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today to the Magnets. I'm Anita Di Chiara, and together with the Magnets team, we want to welcome you all for the first talk of the 2022. Um, so we will have uh, about 20 to 25 minutes presentation. You're invited to keep your microphone muted. Um, and then after that, we we'll have some time for question and answers. You can text, uh, you, can, you can write in the text chat and I can read the, the, your question out loud for you. And, uh, and then there's gonna be a time for informal catch up at the end, which is not gonna be recorded. Um, for today, I'm really, I'm really excited uh, uh, to welcome here Andy Bigging from the University of Liverpool, who will be talking on potential sources of variability and stability in the polymagnetic field. Thank you, Andy. Please share your screen. Thank you. Okay, hopefully that's uh, nice and clear. Yeah. That's fine. Thank you, Andy. Okay. So thanks very much for the, uh, for, for the introduction. Thanks to all the organizers for, for, for inviting me and laying on this, this great uh, seminar series. Uh, series. Um, so I'm going to be, uh, well, the aim of this talk is to bring you up to date with um, some stuff that's been going on at the Liverpool, um, uh, some of the stuff that's been going on at the Liverpool group. Um, starting off with, with Dipole Moment, then if, the, if there's time, we'll, we'll move on to uh, the, um, uh, paleo secular variation and the theme running through this talk will be um, using uh, the outputs of dynamo simulations and comparing those to to magnetic uh, field uh, to paleomagnetic records okay and that's only possible through um, the help of um, a, a whole bunch of collaborators uh, some of whom I've, I've named here okay so um, I like to categorize uh, causes of paleomagnetic variability into to sort of three um, different uh, processes. So on the shortest time scale, we've got what I'm referring to as, as non-linear geodynamo processes. So this is things like secular variation. And then when that gets a little bit out of hand, we call that an excursion. And then when that gets really out of hand, the field collapses. And then when it, it grows back, it's got the opposite polarity, we call that um, a reversal. Um, but I guess the key thing about this uh, cause of, of uh, paleomag variability is that it's, it's the geodynamo doing its own thing. It doesn't need forcing from the outside at all. On a slightly longer time scale, overlapping, then we have uh, potential uh, forcing for mantle convection. So the mantle is the ultimate heat sink uh, for the outer core. And it, um, uh, as such, it's the ultimate provider of convective power uh, for driving um, the dynamo. And therefore, things like uh, changes in the magnitude and the pattern of the, of the core mantle boundary uh, uh, heat flux um, may be expected to affect the, the geodynamo and the magnetic field um, uh, that results from it. Uh, so that could be, you know, any true polar wander will rotate that pattern um, globally in the reference frame of the geodynamo. And then you've got changes in uh, subduction flux uh, resulting from things related to Wilson cycles and, and supercontinent cycles and so on. And then um, on an even longer time scale, have what we're uh, referred to as, as core mantle um, evolution. So this is things like the, the secular cooling of the, the entire, entire planet. And at some point the uh, core grew so cold that it was able to nucleate um, a solid inner core at its center. And that was a, a game changer for the, for the dynamo. Uh, as we'll get to, and then there's various uh, exotic processes that have been um, hypothesized in recent years as well, things like exolution of, of silicates within, uh, within the core that would also cause very long timescale uh, changes. Um, so I think it's fair to say that, that my research interests for, for a long time, uh, and, and those of others as well that I've worked with, have, have been associated with trying to use paleomagnetism as a tool for getting at uh, understanding deep earth and its evolution. So really modes, uh, processes two and three on here. Um, but you've got to be very careful. I want to recognize the, the, the danger uh, for misidentification of which one of these processes you're actually seeing in, in paleomagnetic records. So I'll illustrate that by just talking quickly about um, some uh, uh, dynamo simulation output 
Uh, so this is a simulation, a very special one, because out of the 154 simulations we have on catalogue at uh, Liverpool, um, this is the very best at meeting the criteria of, of Spray Natal 2019, the QPM criteria for showing similar magnetic field behaviour in a statistical sense um, to that observed from paleomagnetic records over the last uh, 10 million years. Okay, so there are five criteria uh, matching um, re referenced here. So two of them relate to uh, what we call model G um, for paleosecular variation, where we plot the um, uh, VGP angular dispersion, so essentially an angular standard deviation um, against the um, latitude or paleomagnetic latitude. The sampling site, and it's been known for a long time that that increases with, with latitude away from the equator, and it's fit reasonably well by this model G, simple two parameter model, uh, where A is the um, uh, refers to the, the VGP dispersion of the equator, and B um, records the tendency of this dispersion to increase with latitude. Uh, so those are the first two parameters, and what we're after misfit values of less than one, so, so we're in good good shape there. We've got the maximum inclination anomaly, so that's a deviation of an inclination uh, from that expected from GAD, and that's very good in line with observations for the last 10 million years. These are all taken from, from Cromwell et al. 2018. We've got the VDM uh, variance or relative variance, um, and this is also in line with what we extract from, uh, from Pint. And it's only the only one that, that marginally fails of these five criteria is this proportion transitional um, uh, one, which is basically saying that this simulation does not reverse quite as often as uh, we would expect it to um, for the given um, reversal record for the last 10 million years. Okay, so it's been kind of well known for a while that if you increase the Rayleigh number, you drive a geodynamo simulation a bit harder, then that can increase the reversal frequency. So that's what we tried in this incidence, uh, in this instance. And we, uh, so a, a modest Rayleigh number increase from 1.6, 1.8 times 10 to the 7 uh, did indeed give us uh, more reversals um, as we expected. But it also had other detrimental effects. So this one is a worse one, so a misfit, a uh, total misfit that's nearly doubled. Um, we fix the proportion transitional, that's now good. Um, but now we've got a higher model GA, we've got more VGP dispersion than we see in the record, and our variance in uh, our relative variance of VDMs, normalized paleo intensities, have also um, uh, gone up out of, out of the range. So this is fairly fairly typical of, of what you see with these dynamo simulations. You fix one thing and then you break others. Okay, but I also want to look at the what happened to the overall VDM um, distribution as well, because by increasing the Rayleigh number um, for the second simulation, we also decreased quite substantially, more than 40%, the, the median VDM as well. So we made it weaker, we made the distribution skewed to low values. Okay, um, now this uh, difference is a result of increasing the Rayleigh number. So this is a sort of signal that would be, you know, would be, we're hoping um, to try and interpret from the paleomagnetic record that the fields got weaker because something has changed in the, in the forcing, perhaps due to mantle convection or so on. And obviously, you know, to get a nice distribution here, we've got 5,000 VDMs. You don't need that many to be able to tell that the, the field has changed. So approximately 60 um, would be sufficient to give you a 95% likelihood of, of, of detecting this change. And actually, the global distribution of where those VDMs come from is, is not as critical as you might think it is. Um, what is really critical in, in telling and uh, determining whether or not you've had a, a, a real change in the, the VDM distribution is the amount of time that you're sampling. Okay, so I'll show you that in a very dramatic way from uh, this second simulation. So what you might have noticed from these time series of dipole tilt and VDM here is that um, occasionally, and most especially in this time period here, this simulation collapses into a weak field state. The VDM becomes much weaker um, and the reversal rate goes through the roof. It becomes quite multipolar. 
and that's illustrated by this um, uh, snapshot of the, the field here. Okay, now if we were to sample only this time period, which is we've taken a million years of model time here, so quite a substantial amount of time, then we'd end up with a BDM distribution that um, gives you a medium that is 68% lower than the actual value recorded. So you record a much more dramatic decrease. Conversely, if you went to the million years subsequent to that, you can see that that's a time period where we've got unusual stability for this simulation. We're missing any of these um, hyper-reversing periods. So then we get a completely different distribution and we get a 71% um, overestimate. Um, and that's actually more or less indistinguishable from what we saw in the first um, simulation. So then you would miss this change um, in the Rayleigh number in this case. I mean, the really crucial thing to notice here is that if you're just basing the fact of, of whether you've sampled um, sufficient time on the directions, then you'll end up in big trouble. Um, because, of course, if you sample the full 5 million years of model time, then you end up with something very close to, to GAD, which is good. But if you sample any of these other smaller, uh, shorter time intervals, you also end up with, with mean VGPs that are very close and within errors of GAD. So you would conclude that you had uh, a good time average from the directions, but in fact, your intensity is, is, is uh, poorly temporally um, uh, representative. Okay, so, and just to bring that back to Earth, um, here's pad M2M, so the model of dipole moment over the last 2 million years, and what we see is um, uh, not quite as dramatic, but still substantial long-term changes. So just if you simply just look at the first million years, compare it to the second million year, you've got a difference of 14% there, which is, which is significant. And you could obviously, you know, restrict yourself just to the brooms and just to periods where you've got many reversals and that, that difference would, would grow larger. So I think the implications of this is that, yeah, intensity time averages are, are much more challenging uh, to observe than, than directional time averages. In fact, you know, they may not even exist really in any sense. Um, and what that means is if, the, if you want to see, you want to detect changes in the dipole moment um, that, you know, we, we can be reasonably confident and not just a consequence of nonlinear geodynamo processes, secular variation and so on, um, then we really need a, a number of studies spanning tens of millions of years, ideally, to be sure of that. Okay, so armed with that information, um, I want to now turn uh, briefly to uh, the, the biggest and thorniest question, I guess, that the paleo intensity has attempted to address in, in recent years, or one of those, uh, which is the, the question of when us in accord uh, did nucleate. Um, so here there's been progress in, in the theoretical side of things. So um, uh, Chris Davis and a bunch of others at, at Leeds and Liverpool just published this, this paper in, in GGI. Um, uh, which essentially is saying that independent of the, the well, or at least with these, with multiple different thermal evolution models, so we've got one where the core mantle boundary heat flow is diminishing exponentially through time, we've got one, the dash line, where it's remaining relatively constant. Both of these are associated with red lines that show a very sharp peak at the moment of inner core nucleation. And the red line is the power available to drive the geodynamo. So inner core nucleation was a game changer in terms of the power available to drive the geodynamo. And through a um, scaling law analysis, which I don't have time to do justice to here, um, it was shown that we would expect such a um, increase in the power available to drive the geodynamo to be evident as a, um, uh, as a large increase a sharp increase in um, in the dipole moment. Okay, so I guess the answer, the first answer to this question, when did the core nucleate? Well, it would be sometime after a sharp um, or during at the time of, of a sharp increase in, in dipole moment. Okay, so we've obviously been looking for this for, for some time now, and this was uh, uh, one attempt in, in 2015. Um, that we published where we suggested that it might be happening in the Mesoproterozoic between about a billion and 1.5 billion years ago. More recently, as uh, Bono et al. Um, published this, 
um, paper um, suggesting that, in fact, it happened considerably later than that, um, during or soon after the Ediacaran um, period, which terminated 540 um, million years ago. Uh, so at this juncture, I will just give a shout out for, a, um, uh, for the PINT database, which enables us to, to improve on these, um, uh, on these studies. So this um, has been newly updated um, just published online, so a huge amount of work from um, from a, a lot of people here at Liverpool, but not, uh, notably um, Richard Bonner and, and Greg Patterson, um, and Richard's made this nice website as well that's online now, so you can download things. This is only presently up to date till the end of 2019. There's a further update coming on, but most of the data that I'll just be going over now um, is uh, subsequent to that um, yeah, to, to, to this update, so it's not in this present database, but I, I'm told it will be soon. Okay, so I guess the first thing we're interested in is, was this, this you know, this result, this, this time average of, um, of the septils, low VDM um, from the Ediacaran, uh, published by Bono et al., was that supported by other data from a similar time period? Uh, so this was very much the, the PhD of uh, Dan Thalner, who's now at uh, University of Florida with Courtney Sprain, and um, a bunch of studies here um, kind of confirming this original finding. So we have the East European Craton, we've got the Grenville Dykes, and we've got Skinner Cove Lavas. Um, and they're all showing similar, there's a suggestion that there might be a bit of a step change at the end, which, you know, could be indicative of inner core nucleation. I don't really want to go there. I guess the, the main thing is to, to point out the, the scale on the y-axis here, right? So everything, all these new data are below two um, times 10 to the 22 meters squared. Uh, so given that today's field is uh, around about eight and the uh, long-term average over the last few hundred million years is somewhere between four or five. These are really low estimates, consistently low estimates spanning uh, tens of millions of years. It really does look like the Ediacaran was a period of sustained um, uh, low field for whatever reason. Going back a bit earlier in time, Mesoproterozoic is a bit of a wasteland for, sorry, the Neoproterozoic is a wasteland for, um, for paleo intensity uh, results. So we've been trying to fill that. Um, and this is PhD of, of Simon Lloyd, um, who's still with us at, at Liverpool, and uh, he published a, a study from um, uh, Franklin Dykes uh, in the Canadian Arctic, 720 million years, um, and also these uh, Bangamol Sills from northwestern Australia, and um, these seem to support the trend shown here by the dashed line of Bono et al, suggesting a decay through this time. But then there's a wild card, which is these mundine welks, uh, wells, dikes, 750 million years, uh, also from Northwest Australia, and they're coming out relatively uh, high, just 30 million years before the, uh, the Franklin dikes. So, you know, this could be, um, you know, 30 million years, that's time in the Phanerozoic record for the big, big shift in, in dipole moment, or it could be simply the, um, the, the nonlinear geodynamo process that I referred to um, already. Um, but either way, it's looking quite difficult then to, to be sure that we've got the signature of, of inner core nucleation uh, happening at the, the Ediacaran. And looking a bit later in time as well, I'm sorry I keep on switching the, the time axis uh, on you, by the way, but that's going to that's going to be a feature check because I borrowed the original uh, figures. Um, but yeah, a bit later in time now, we're looking at the mid um, protozoic dipole low, and um, these are the results from the PhD of Louise Hawkins. And um, uh, she established this um, wrote a paper um, proposing mid Paleozoic dipole low. So, this, this period, um, the most of the, the, the Devonian and the um, uh, early Carboniferous where the field, again, seemed to be sustained low, very low values over tens of millions of years. Um, good quality data. Um, a bit later on, we've got um, not so good quality data, but strongly suggesting that there was a sharp rise in, in uh, dipole moment then around the, the Kyanum supercron. Okay, so, you know, variation like this, typically taken to, to refer to, to mantle uh, force variations, uh, rather than inner core nucleation, but we don't know those two sig signals are, um, are overlapping. 
and put all that together, uh, final time axis switch. You can see there's all the new data in, in red here. You see the case for these um, low dipole moment periods in the Ediacaran, mid Paleozoic, and really highlighting that we need to um, address the early Paleozoic. Um, now we've got a few things in motion, 500 million years or so. These tend to come out quite low, uh, actually, but we desperately need something, particularly from the um, Ordovician supercron to see if that was high, um, like we see in the in the Kaiman. So did we have a you know a um, an evolution like this or more like this? Okay, so. Um, I've still got a little bit of time left, so I will move on to talking about the um, uh, a little bit about actually how we can use uh, secular variation to um, uh, rather than it being a barrier to to determining um, deep earth conditions, how we can actually use it. So this, this is a study that um, we published um, a couple of years ago, um, arguing that secular variation was actually um, or paleo-secular variation, very powerful tool for uh, telling us about the ancient morphology um, of the field. So this was based on, on dynamo simulations, first and foremost, but you can see that as this model A parameter decreases as we go along the section of these different dynamo models, then also the axial dipole dominance, so this is just the power in the axial dynamo, uh, axial dipole um, divided by the rest of the field truncated to degree in order 10, that goes up, okay? So, and we can see the Earth using PSV10, using um, for the last 10 million years, using GGF 100K for the last 100,000 years, that kind of sits somewhere in the middle um, of this range. When we put together a lot of dynamo models, and also included uh, some various models from Earth, including GGF 100K, those are these green dots here. And what we found was rather a nice power law. Okay, so the model G A parameter could be used to predict this axial dipole dominance. Okay, and this was this struck us as, as very um, important because this model G is something we can get billion years ago, um, whereas you know the, the shape of the magnetic field is not so easy. To estimate um, uh, before recent times. Okay, so this is just showing that many models, um, well, there are a few models were much more stable, like this blue one, than today's field. Uh, some are a little bit more unstable, and this one, and many were a lot more unstable than what we see in the paleomagnetic records. Okay, so this is a combination of um, sort of a, a compilation of. Um, uh, PSV estimates, VGP dispersion by latitude, um, put together from three recent studies in the last 300 million years, and then compared to a slightly older study that looked at, at the Precambrian. And the extraordinary thing about these is that when you fit the model G to them, their parameters are very, very similar. So when you average on these, that's not to say that paleo secular variation never changes. When you look at it on these extremely long time scales, it looks very similar. There's been, it doesn't look like there's been any strong secular change in, in uh, PSV. Okay, and it's actually quite a narrow window that we see. So these, these red dashed lines, these incorporate the error estimates from all three of those composite curves that I just showed you. And you can see it's actually quite a narrow window um, within this power law. So what this is saying is that most dynamo simulations are falling outside the region. Most of them are, are just too, uh, too unstable and um, uh, not, dipo not axial dipole dominated enough. Okay, and this stability of the shape of the magnetic field over billions of years is, you know, is not a new idea. It's something that's kind of relied on for tectonic reconstructions, paleogeography, and so on. So I'm just showing here a reference to, to um, Dave Evans' paper from 2006, where he used evaporites um, to argue that GAD was a pretty good assumption all the way back to Archean times. And Got this quotation from here that consistently axial and dipolar geomagnetic reference volume imply, implies stability of geodynamo processes on billion year timescales. All right, now that's true, and that is actually quite surprising and, and quite important. What that's telling us that the, the magnetic field has been so stable. 
And the thing that makes it even more surprising is that these geodynamo simulations are really not stable, right? So I said already that most of them are too variable. Okay, and I've got this, this kind of golden window shown here, but now we're plotting model GA parameter against the Rayleigh number. Okay, and what you can see is that there's a very clear pattern, this is whether, whether you're chemically forced or thermally uh, forced, whether you have homogeneous boundary conditions or heterogeneous boundary conditions with these parameters. What you see is that you increase the Rayleigh number, you move quite quickly through this region of stability and into, into fields that don't look like long-term average. Okay, now given that the Earth has been subject to all sorts of forcings from various things, not least in core nucleation, um, uh, over its history, it's quite surprising then that we can still maintain ourselves in this field. So I just wanted to highlight then these, these new models just being run um, by uh, John Mound and Chris Davies at Leeds. And they gave us a gas coefficient to play around with. And what we saw is that one of these, the one with homogeneous boundary conditions, should say that these are run at this E is the Ekman number. So this is the visc viscous over the ro uh, rotation force. This one's an order of magnitude lower than the rest. It's, it's closer to, um, uh, to Earth-like parameters, which are, which are far beneath this, something like 10 to the minus 16, um, but argued to be in the same regime where rotation is dominant um, or is an is a important force in ordering the flow within the core, but also sufficiently high Rayleigh number that you get a lot of turbulence as well. When you run these simulations, if you have homogeneous boundary conditions, then you get a similar result to the rest. You very quickly going into the multipolar um, uh, regime well away from the, the Earth-like um, observations. Okay, but a little bit of, um, or actually quite a lot of um, heterogen, thermal heterogeneity at the base of the mantle, that seems to have this remarkably, remarkable stabilizing effect. So the pattern of heterogeneity is that just taken from, um, from seismic uh, tomography of the lowermost mantle, from Masters et al, uh, Q star is the magnitude of this, of this heterogeneity. And we can see what's happening here, unlike in any of the other cases, we've got a factor of three increase in the Rayleigh number, um, but we still have a stable model GA parameter and a stable um, uh, dipole dominated field. So this may be significant. So just to briefly talk about how that can be. Um, uh, so essentially this is the, the flow in, in two of these models. And what you can see is that there's big sort of uh, faded patches in the middle representing the shapes um, uh, of the LLSVPs. We're just below the core mantle boundary here, about 200 kilometers. And um, you can see the flow is, has been suppressed very heavily um, by the LLSVPs. The LLSVPs are hot. They don't suck. The heat flux underneath them is very, very low. And so they are suppressing the flow in the core beneath them. And also the magnetic field at the core mantle boundary is therefore heavily um, uh, governed, particularly at low latitudes, by these regions of suppressed um, uh, flow. So essentially, we have very little um, uh, magnetic flux generated. Essentially, the field's imposing an order on, um, uh, sorry, the, the, the LLSVPs are imposing a large scale order on the field, particularly at low latitudes, which is tending to suppress things like the equatorial dipole, which would upset the um, um, uh, the dipole dominance, the axial dipole dominance of the field. Okay, and just very quickly to say, we also see longitudinal variations uh, in these simulations. So they vary from model to model, but the final one of these looks very much like the variability that we see in, um, uh, in GGF 100K as well. So we've got marginal suppression of VGP angular dispersion, um, above where the BGP, where the yellow SVPs are. Okay, I'll skip over this. Um, and yeah, just make a final final point that this these green points, these are the ones that, a, um, uh, that sit nicely in the window that are from these uh, heterogeneous um, uh, low Ekman number simulations that feature these uh, this regional stratification. And so the red circle in here is GGF 100K, so that also sits nicely in the, um, in the middle of this. And the fact that this is so stable, does it suggest that LLL, 
uh, SVPs are stabilizing the magnetic field, could they be doing so over geological time scales? Um, well, I just want to point out here that I'm not saying that these LSVPs look exactly the same over billions of years. Um, but, you know, if we've got a, a simulation like this one, uh, geodynamic mantle flow over the last 300 million years, you can see that the LSVPs represented by these areas of low commantle heat flow um, have moved around in, in blue. So they've moved around a lot over this time, but they're still covering significant amounts of the, of the low, um, of the equatorial part of the commental boundary. And that might be sufficient to impose this large scale order and stabilizing effect on the, on the magnetic field. Okay, so summary of findings. Um, I guess I've, I've just about stuck to time um, there, but you can read these uh, for yourself and I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Let's give a big round of applause. Thank you very much. A very interesting talk. Um, and the floor now is open for questions. You can use the chat, the chat uh, uh, box or ask them away. Um, yes, Kathy, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, sorry, there having trouble unmuting there. No problem. Uh, I don't Point of clarification, please. Um, I think I maybe I misunderstood this, but early on you said that uh, when you were talking about the formation of the inner core, um, did I understand you correctly to say that the increase in power that you get from the formation of the inner core necessarily results in an increase in dipole moment? Well, that's what the scaling law predicts. Okay, so there's a nice scaling law based on the QG Mach um, force balance, which is thought to be appropriate for Earth. And um, hundreds of, of dynamo simulations that, that Chris collated and found, yeah, a, um, a, a nice scaling law um, that predicted that outcome. One thing to be, to be borne in mind with that is that all those simulations were dipole dominated. Okay, so what that... Um, means is actually if that power trips it over towards the multipolar um, uh, behavior then actually you might expect the opposite but yes as things stand with the um, uh, yeah with the, the current state of the art of, of dynamo simulations and, and the scaling law that it applies um, from that it does seem as though uh, yes we should expect a significant increase in, in dipole moment as a result thank you thank you uh, Johannes? Yeah, thank you. Hi, Andy. Thanks for the nice Hi. talk. Thank you. Now I have first first a remark and then a question, I guess, because to Kathy's um, question, I mean, for the scaling, you just use the scaling laws, right? Based on dynamo simulations, but also on some theory, which basically tell you that the, the energy or the magnetic field strength goes with the power to the one third, right? So, so that's what all it tells you. But I think this is not really based on simulations that have no inner core and something that have a core. And when you do this, you see that basically the increase in magnetic field strength that you could see as an observer is much weaker than this scaling law would predict. Uh, simply because when you nucleate an inner core, the action of dynamic generation moves deeper into the core. So what you see at the surface is somewhat less than the power law predict. But this was not my question. So it, my question regards these simulations you showed at the end, these low equa numbers, 10 to minus five simulations, right? Which looked quite nice actually, and had this uh, tomographic heat flux at the commodity boundary. So are these simulations also reversing or are they not reversing? No, they're not reversing. They're, so they're no computationally expensive as you can imagine. And so, they're so only run for 100,000 yeah. years of model time. So half a diffusion time. Okay, so, but when you look at the VGP dispersion, it looks about the, the correct amount. Yes, which yeah. might suggest that it, they could reverse. Yeah. Okay. So the final slide that I didn't have time to show you is actually comparing them to, to GGF 100K. 
because that's mm -hmm. also obviously 100,000 years. That doesn't reverse either. The Le Champ does not register as a reversal according to these criteria. So therefore, they actually, um, yeah, GGF 100K fails <laughs> the criteria, doesn't perform particularly well. Um, okay. And these simulations match better GGF 100K than they do the, the 10 million year uh, simulations. And that could be just because, yeah, they're not running long enough for, 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 for reversals to happen, because that will then yeah, indeed. Have a knock on impact on the, um, uh, on the BDM variability as well, very strongly. Um, yes. So that would be another criteria that's kind of automatically missed just by them being too short to have reversals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other question? Maybe you can show us the slide you prepared with the G GFK, Andrew K uh, model. I'm curious now. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so... Then Carl has a question, but... Uh, uh... Okay, so I'll just yeah. keep this. So yeah. first of all, I show you a comparison to the, yeah, the last 10 million years. Um, so here it's shown graphically rather than as a, as a table, but for the four uh, different models. Sorry, and... I can't see it, sorry. Oh, Thank sorry, you. sorry, sorry. Thank you. Oh, a lot of questions coming now. That's good. Thank you. Okay, so, okay. I'll, I'll, keep this, I'll keep this brief. But yeah, so this is it for, for, um, for the QPM criteria shown as a green bar. So you can see that for model GA and the inclination anomaly, which is kind of the morphological one, that they do pretty well, but then model GB not so good. And then the VDM variability and reversals, yeah, not good at all. Um, but then that's also the bring on the red bar the, to show what GGF 100K is, that, that has the same problem. So essentially, um, yeah, it's uh, model GB is, is, is very flat as GGF 100K, which is kind of interesting. I'm not sure what that signifies, um, but it also has way too low BDM variability um, and yeah, no reverses. Thank you. So uh, I will take now Carl's uh, question. Yeah, uh, hi Andy. Uh, thank you very for the very nice talk. Um, yeah. I was especially also interested in these very low Ekman number models because uh, uh, they seem to show that you get a much finer structure in the heat flow, but also probably in the general convection patterns in the outer core. Uh, and as we know, the Ekman number for the Earth is even, I think, seven orders of magnitude smaller than what you showed. So. So we probably have to expect that this, this fine structure is, is by far finer even than these models. So uh, would you say that the reason for the fact that the um, mantle in homo or the core mantle boundary inhomogeneities become more important is that the, the frequency or the wavelength of the of the uh, convection patterns is becomes much smaller than the wavelength of the uh, of the inhomogeneities at the core mantle boundary. Is that the reason why why this dominates? Or it, it could well be. So yes, I think that's that that makes um, yeah good sense. So essentially, um, it's. Yeah, the, so the, these models show exhibit this phenomenon of regional inversion lenses, you know, which which um, Mound et al. published in 2019 in Nature Geoscience, but in non-magnetic simulations. Okay, so it's essentially regional stratification of the uppermost core. So, and what that is is, yeah, the so and that was robust over a, you know a very large parameter range, providing yeah you were at these. Uh, you know, the, these low Ekman numbers. And yes, the reason is essentially that, as I understand it, um, is that you need to be in a regime where the mantle, large scale mantle inhomogeneities set up um, a, a lens of, of stratified flow or suppressed flow at least. And then as you increase the Rayleigh number, 
although you know the, the, the flow gets faster it also becomes finer scale and therefore yes it just can't it can't disrupt something that's so so much bigger than it is and yeah the the, the lower Ekman numbers sorry the higher Ekman numbers if you're at two high Ekman numbers then yeah you just the, these homogeneities just do completely different things you don't you don't seem to get these the, this regional stratification at all either you stratify everything um, or you end up or you yeah and, and to very great depths in the core sometimes or you um, yeah you just you don't really you have sort of ephemeral effects thank you thank you um andre Thank you, Andy. Great talk. Very clear, very clear cut. I have a very brief question, actually, concerning the, the data you showed. Well, uh, what would you think of the this huge dispersion, VDM dispersion during the Cayman? And also, it seems that the, there have not been so, so many re recent studies of this period. I, I fully agree, and I would love yeah, to see more data. So, any idea why the dispersion will, could be so high? Oof. If it's uh, real, if it's real, okay. or it's just the data? I, 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 uh, I mean, like, the data quality. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's I, I, a, I, I, yeah, yet another period to look. Yes, it is. I, I don't know. I don't want to comment really on whether okay. it could okay. be. It yeah. could be the. The, the quality of the data that's, yeah. I mean, some of the studies are, are universally high and that kind of, you know, that could fit with some of the dynamo yes. stations where you, where you enter this, you know, it tends to be low Rayleigh numbers. You get a very efficient, you know, um, dipole dominated uh, behavior where the field doesn't, you know, never really collapses. So you end up with quite a small dispersion, but then, yeah, if, um, yeah, it quickly it always you're... has been a temptation to tell, okay, you have Supercron, you have high, uh, VDM high, and uh, vice versa. Yeah, but we I never could prove it. We're thinking so of the as being very distinct because I think, you know, I, I think you can, a Supercron is just a time where you haven't quite edged over into the reversing, you know, regime mm -hmm. that collapse. And I think that that can be quite a subtle transition to that, you know, so, you know, I've heard it argued that maybe the brooms could be like a supercon and, you know, I don't see anything to, you know, either in the data or the, you know, to, to dispute yep. that in terms of, yep. you know, the, the behavior of dipole moment and so yep. on. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Well, another thing, probably not only the quality of the data, but also the, uh, the uncertainty in the age, they usually eye for, for all the times we're talking Variabilities are real for but on which yes. age range? So, Agree. sorry, I, I comment as well. Um, thank you, uh, Gunther. Hi, Andy. Nice effort Hi. in putting this uh, talk together, like you did uh, for this uh, presentation. I, I, I admit I don't really understand the dynamo and how it works, and I always uh, have this uh, how 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 what's the what's the role of correlative force when you are generating these dynamos uh okay so i guess i have to be quite careful there's people that are infinitely better qualified than i am to talk about this actual dynamo modelers um but as as the, i mean rotation is is absolutely paramount as a force in in the, the dynamo we think so it organizes um the flow parallel to the rotation axis. So it adds kind of almost a, a, a rigidity um, to the flow structure. So it stops it all just got to kind of be radial convection and instead forms these, you know, tends to form these, these columns that are aligned um, with the rotation axis. So, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's paramount in the force balance. On, so, on, so they would be going, let's say, in clockwise direction in the Northern Hemisphere and uh, Counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere, correct? Uh, yes, as far as I understand it, Johannes, do you wanna? Yeah. 
Uh, well, you have uh, you have these. Well, we tend to think of these columns, right? And they go through north south, right? They go just right through the Earth core. And you have both types, you know, counter rotating and clockwise and counterclockwise rotation. Both columns exist, but they are ordered. They are so they are columns along the rotation axis, as as Andy said. But both types exist. I mean, I think of it as like I guess the um, you know, meteorology sense. So you get you get depressions and and so you get cyclones and anticyclones. Yeah, that's that's a similar origin, right? But well, but I mean, these these columns, they you see them in in in, uh, in in simple simulations. Of course, when it becomes more complex, like these ECMA number ten to minus five simulations that Andy showed, you don't really see columns anymore, or or, or only. You know hints of it and in a statistical sense you don't see big columns reaching through from north to south that's not possible anymore because everything is so turbulent but in a statistical sense this is still there okay and so now it comes to my question um, so it looks to me that in order uh, that once you have a certain rotation rate that these columns are forming but there must be a certain rate which probably relate to the viscosity, or I don't know, at which you perturb this column formation. And I wonder, I mean, what are your thoughts about estimate, estimation of this rotation rate, which would become critical uh, for these columns? So my, my understanding is that rotation rate is very, very much less than the rotation rate of the Earth. So we are very much into the rotationally dominated or rotationally influenced regime. So for example, Venus would not have that or would it? No, I, I think Venus, as far as I understand, I think the problem with Venus is not the rotation rate. I know that it's, it's much slower, um, but it's still sufficient to, um, you know, to, to allow for, a, you know, for, uh, a rotationally dominated dynamo. It's just that, um, yeah, probably the heat flow is not enough on Venus. So that's probably what it is. Well, thank you, Andy. Okay, thank you. Um, Boris? Hello, uh, hello, Andy. Thank Hi, you for your, thank you for your presentation. I, I, I have a question about the, the influence of the LLSVPs on the, the magnetic field. And um, I was wondering what kind of uh, influence it has. Uh, do, you, do you think that the LLSVPs would produce a, a different magnetic field, whether you are uh, um, over the LLSVPs or 90 degrees off? Or what kind of, um, uh, what would be the influence yes, of the LLSVPs on the, the geometry of, of the magnetic field? Well, it's, 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 a lot of work to be done in, in that uh, regard. Um, but what we see in these ones is that, yeah, they suppress the magnetic field directly beneath them. Um, and then obviously, you know, that's at the core mantle boundary. Then you go all the way up to the surface and you smooth that out quite a bit. So it's, but it's perhaps um, observable at surface, you know, GGF 100K, you know, uh, mm -hmm. seems, to, seems to show this, you know, this nice, non-zonal signature of, of um, suppressed VGP dispersion above those, those LLSVPs. So if you move them, if you move the LLSVPs around, you might expect the, that signature to go around. I guess what, what is really wide open at the moment is what that does to the sort of, you know, the next uh, stage of the, the global field or the, or the you know, the, the axisymmetric field whether they were still, if you just had one big LLSVP at the equator, whether that would still um, impose a similar stabilizing effect to that which we see at two. I suspect it would have a qualitatively similar effect um, just because it's gonna impose a large scale order on the field that's gonna not allow, you know, the axial, the equatorial dipole is the main, you know, um, a disruptive influence to the axial dipole and you know if you can't have that if you don't if you've got you know quite strong zonal um asymmetry sorry non-zonal asymmetry on the at the equator 
Okay, thank you. And how would, uh, I have a second question related to this is um, how would you have your uh, equatorial dipole in how uh, the equatorial dipole would be positioned uh, with respect to this uh, uh, LLSVP uh, geometry? Do you know this or? Oh, are you, I think, are you getting at the sort of persistent equatorial dipole idea for the... Yeah, maybe, or, or maybe the magnetic field could still be uh, dominated by an axial dipole, but I guess you could have a combination of the two, or I don't know. Yeah, I, so I don't know, this is real speculation, <laughs> so <laughs> I just don't know, but I guess, you know, if... If you didn't have LSVPs at the equator at all, then maybe that would help uh, an equatorial dipole forming. And then yeah, it yeah. might be rooted, you know, uh, to perhaps uh, antipodal um, regions of particularly high heat flow. Okay. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Unfortunately, is uh, the time is nearly up. So uh, we don't have uh, time for more questions. Um, thanks again, Andy. Another big round of applause for you. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen for our next uh, uh, updates. Um, so the, the seminar schedule so far looks like we are gonna have Marco Mafione from University of Birmingham um, the 16th of March. And then 23rd of March, we're gonna have uh, uh, two, two speakers from the Royal Academy of Art in the Ag. And, uh, and maybe in April or maybe after the EG, we're gonna move to EE Eastern Hemisphere time slot. And we always uh, welcome more speakers. And then thank you very much again for coming. And I would like to remind you that you can watch and rewatch the videos on the YouTube channel um, and uh, yeah, I hope to see you uh, next time. Thank you very much. Thank you all.